Okay, hi there. Um, welcome. My name is Alex. Um, I'm a member of the Woodstock Pollinator Pathway Planning Committee. Uh, and thank you for joining us tonight for Neonicotinoid Pesticides and Pollinators with Dan Rochelle of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, after the presentation, there will be a question and answer period. And if you could please use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom right of your Zoom screen um, to submit any questions that come up for you during the presentation. Um, Mr. Rochelle will be getting to as many of them as he can. So again, please use the little box that says Q&A and not the chat box to put in all of your questions so that they can be um, head, handed to our moderators. The Woodstock Pollinator Pathway is helping to create and helping to empower others to create contiguous essential habitat in our community for our vital pollinator population, which has been threatened by habitat loss, climate change, invasive species, and the use of pesticides, such as those we will be discussing tonight. The Woodstock Pollinator Pathway is a collaborative effort of the Woodstock Land Conservancy, the Catskill Center, Woodstock NY Transition, the Woodstock Environmental Commission, and members of our community. To learn more about joining the pathway or to watch any of the previous webinars that they've hosted, um, please visit www.woodstocknypollinatorpathway.org. And please check out our partner organizations as well. Um, all of their websites are gonna be linked in the chat box. Um, they're all doing really important work in our community towards preserving our natural resources, improving our sustainability efforts, and helping us to mitigate and adapt to the effects of the climate crisis. Tonight's presentation, we also really have to mention, it could not have been possible without the help of Kathy Nolan, who is the Senior Research Director at Catskill Mountain Keeper. So from all of us at the Pollinator Pathway, thank you, Kathy, so much for all of the work you do um, every day um, and for helping us arrange this evening tonight to raise awareness on this uh, awareness on this important issue. And our presenter this evening, Mr. Rochelle, is a member of the Lands and Wildlife Program of the NRDC, which focuses on protecting our nation's bee populations for the ever-growing threats to their health and to their continued existence, and in particular, the use of bee toxic pesticides. Before joining the wildlife team, he was the co-director of NRDC's Community Fracking Defense Project and an advocate for the cleanup of industrial pollution in the New York region. And tonight, what he's going to be doing is helping us to understand the problems that neonicotinoids cause to the pollinator population, but also what are some of the things that we can do about it um, and to help and to help kind of prevent these issues. So thank you again so much for coming and uh, have, a, have a lovely evening, enjoy, thank you. Uh, well, hi all. Uh, yeah, as, a, as announced, my name is Dan Rochelle. Uh, I work with the Natural Resources Defense Council um, and I'm going to share my screen here and start um, the slideshow. Hopefully, everybody can see this. Okay. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, I work uh, for NRDC. My primary issue is pollinators, um, AKA saving the bees. And um, in a past life, I did. Um, a lot of work in New York on fracking and also uh, the cleanup of PCBs in the Hudson River. Um, but today I'm, I'm here to talk about neonic pesticides and why they're such a concern uh, for bees, other pollinators, and also New York's environment at large and um, the health of New Yorkers. But to start with a little background, um, let's focus on the, hum on the humble honeybee. So um, as folks in this group probably know, bees are really important. One out of three bites of food that we take um, depend upon pollinators for their existence. And about three quarters of the world's top 100 crops need some form of pollination, usually from bees, but 
you know, uh, possibly also from insects or, or other pollinators, birds, bats, etc. Um, so, so they're incredibly important to give you a sense of, you know, what this might look like in a grocery store for some context. Here's a picture of, you know, a normal grocery store uh, in a world with bees. Here's what that same grocery store looks like without bees. So um, certainly we would still have food, but we would have a lot less of it. We would have a lot less variety. It would likely be more expensive um, because even with foods that don't completely require insect pollination, they benefit from it. Um, and it would be harder to get the essential nutrients um, that we get from the diversity of food that we eat today. Um, beyond the grocery store, um, there's also the natural world. So pollinators are essential to 95 or sorry, 85% of flowering plants, um, which is most plants on the face of the earth. Um, so if we see further losses of pollinators, if we lose bees, if we lose pollinators, um, we are not only worried about food security issues, but we're worried ab about the loss of whole ecosystems. And that's sort of um, the concern because about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, beekeepers across the country and across the world started seeing their honeybee colonies die en masse. Before that point, beekeepers were losing about 10, 15% of their colonies a year. And that flipped around 2006 to 30, 40, 50% a year. And those numbers have continued at that high and concerning rate since that time. Um, and, you know, while beekeepers, honey beekeepers in the United States have been able to maintain colony levels overall because there's a whole system, a network of folks that rebreed queens and split hives in order to keep those numbers stable so that, that these bees can continue to pollinate our crops, the same is not true of all of our native pollinators. Um, which again, this group probably knows, um, aren't all honeybees, right? We have just in the bees alone, over 4,000 species of bees in the United States and over 400 species of native bees in New York alone. Uh, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors, including our favorite, um, the rusty patch bumblebee. So um, unlike honeybees, native bees are not regularly counted and cataloged. So we, we don't have a real good sense um, of what's happening to those native species the same way that we do with honeybees. Um, but we do have a few indicator species and, and the rusty patch bumblebee is one. And this is the first bee in the continental United States uh, put on the endangered species list. And actually NRDC was involved in the litigation that helped make that happen. Um, but this was one of the most common bumblebees that you'd see across the Midwest and the Northeast until, at re until as recently as the mid 1990s. And since that time, we know that this bee has lost about 90% of its range. Um, so it used to be, you know, as you can see on the map, a fairly common bee in New York. These days really only found in patches in the Midwest uh, and some in the mid-Atlantic mid as well. But I believe a bee hasn't been seen in New York for some time. So, um, and it's worth noting that these native bees, the rusty patch and others, are not only important for ecosystems, but they are also important crop pollinators, which is something that gets lost too. I think a lot of times people don't associate native bees with crop pollination or they only associate honeybees but as the research continues to show, native pollinators are important to agriculture as they are to ecosystems. So what's, you know, what's, what's the problem with bees? What's harming bees? Um, the science seems to show that it's, it's a number of factors. It's sort of a death of a thousand cuts. And some of the big ones are climate change, um, uh, loss of habitat, often to monocultural agriculture, other times to urban sprawl, 
uh, there are diseases and parasites. And this is a picture of the Varroa mite. If you can see there, the little brown dots on the back of the bee. Uh, somebody said, if you want a, a sense of scale, it would be like something the size of your fist attached to you, um, trying to suck the life out of you. Um, that's actually a disease just for honeybees, not for native bees, but, but a big concern. Uh, and last but not least, pesticides. So um, a lot of my work centers on pesticides, and in particular, one class of pesticide that is particularly pernicious, and that is um, known as neonicotinoids, or you know, new nicotine-like substance is what the name means. So we have three big concerns with neonics. The first is that neonics are just super duper toxic to insects. To give you a sense of scale here, just one neonic treated corn seed can have enough active ingredient to kill about a quarter million bees or more. And um, you know, since neonics were introduced, they've made US agriculture about 48 times more harmful to insect life. And if for folks looking at the chart, I don't know if you can read this, but the light blue bar is sort of the harmfulness attributable to neonics and the dark blue bar is that of all other insecticides combined. And this is, this is from a 2019 study. Um, so very toxic to bees, very toxic to other insects. The second big problem with neonics is that they are really good at contaminating the whole environment. So they're systemic insecticides, which means they're designed to permeate plant tissues, to get into the leaves, the roots, uh, the fruit, the pollen, the nectar, everything, to make the plant itself toxic to insects, to make the plant itself the pesticide. So this means that neonics can be applied in all sorts of interesting new ways. Of course, you can spray it um, like you would a traditional insecticide, you know, and it kills the bug. Um, but unlike traditional insecticides that you spray and they sort of dissipate, neonics are meant to hang around. It, it also means like these systemic properties mean that you can paint neonics on a crop seed. And this is a, a picture of that. Here's a bunch of corn seed um, coated with pesticides. I'm actually not certain that these are neonics, but this is what they often look like. They, they color them sort of weird, strange colors to, to let you know that a pesticide is on the seed. Uh, and sort of look like toxic Skittles. Um, but the principle here is that by painting the pesticide on the seed, the plant literally soaks up the pesticide through its roots as it's growing and becomes toxic to insects. Now it's not a super efficient way of applying the pesticide because only about two to 5% get into the target crop. The other 94 plus percent, and I should note some of it's released as dust during planting, but the other 94 plus percent stays in the soil where it can persist for years. And those same properties that let the pesticide get into the plant also means that they're very water soluble. So anytime it rains, anytime there's irrigation or lawn watering, those neonics are moving through the soil, they're contaminating new soil, if there are wild plants in that soil, those plants will soak up the pesticides, their pollen, their nectar will become toxic to pollinators. And if there is a waterway nearby, that waterway is going to become contaminated with the pesticide. Third big problem with neonics is that they're just about everywhere. Um, they're the most popular insecticide class in the US. Um, a lot of people associate neonic use with agriculture, and that's true. They're, they're used all over the place in agriculture, but they're also um, used all over the place off the farm too, in lawns, home gardens, pet products, bed bug products, commercial landscapes, you name it. Um, these pesticides are all over the place. And you know the sum total effect of all of this is that neonics are ubiquitous contaminants in soil, plant life, water, over major swaths of the country. And to give you a sense here, um, this is tracking just the use of one of five major neonics. And 2009, I know is not super recent, but if anything, that map would look even more filled in today. 
And this map um, is from USGS. It only tracks um, agricultural uses. So if you added all of those lawn and garden uses in urban and suburban areas, a lot of those white areas uh, on the map would be filled in. So again, it, it looks pretty filled out, um, but just one out of five neonics and just one type of use and it's 10 years ago. So um, these things are really everywhere. So what, is that, what does that add up to in terms of ecological impact? Well, the first is that we know neonics are definitely killing bees. And again, you know, there are a lot of problems that are affecting bee losses, but there's only one that maps really well with that sudden spike in losses that we saw in bee colonies in the mid 2000s. And that's the sudden spike in use um, of neonics, in particular their use on corn and soybean seeds. Uh, and I should have showed that at the chart earlier, but you can see the spike in neonic use corresponds really well to that this 2006 sudden loss of, of honeybee colonies. Uh, and it's fairly well confirmed in the scientific literature, uh, including a massive new report from Cornell University. Um, neonics are driving these bee losses, which again, are maintaining at about 40% a year across the country, give or take. Um, and again, that's a concern, not just for honeybees, but also all of the native bee species. Um, but we've learned um, in the last 15 years that neonics are so much worse than just their impacts to bees and other pollinators. Um, for one, we have more and more evidence now that neonics are, are affecting bird populations. Uh, and that sort of happens in one of two ways. Neonics can directly impact birds, directly kill birds, um, most often through neonic treated seeds, because as you can imagine during planting time, uh, oftentimes there are seed spills, oftentimes the seeds are shallow enough that a bird can eat it, and just one neonic treated seed can have enough active ingredient to kill a small songbird. Even for bigger birds, um, if they eat just a few seeds, they can become disoriented, uh, that can interfere with their migration or other survival skills. Um, so multiple different ways that these pesticides can directly harm birds. Um, they can also indirectly harm birds um, by wiping out their food source. Um, as you can imagine, having the entire in, you know, uh, landscape contaminated with a neurotoxin that kills all insect life, um, that's a problem for insect eating birds. And this study here is um, from just last summer, making that connection, making that link between um, neonic use and the decline in bird biodiversity in the United States. And unsurprisingly, um, we see this, uh, the, the declines in grassland birds and insect eating birds. Um, and there's also a good study from France and the Netherlands from earlier, um, making that connection between the losses of birds and the use of neonics. Um, we also know that neonics can wipe out fish populations in the same way. Um, as you can imagine, uh, when neonics are in water, they're just as toxic to many of those aquatic insects as they are to bees and other insects on land. And um, those aquatic insects, while we may not, we may think they're gross or, or um, may not think of them much at all, um, they're hugely important to aquatic food webs. So there was a good study in Japan that came out uh, in 2019 that made the connection between the sudden collapse of a fishery in Japan and the introduction of neonics in nearby agriculture. And this is a really important study because it had data dating all the way back to uh, the early 1990s um, because it's actually hard to get a controlled study these days because neonics are already everywhere. Um, so this was a really enlightening study, uh, again, showing that connection between the sudden introduction of neonics into the ecosystem and uh, the sudden collapse of insect eating fish populations. Um, I should also mention here, even though it's not um, on this slide, an interesting study out of South Dakota, um, making the connection between neonic exposure and birth defects in white-tailed deer. Um, and this study sort of came about 
after anecdotal reports of hunters in the area, um, after they killed a deer, they noticed sort of weird deformities with the deer, weird um, shaped jaws, uh, strange things going on with the organs. Uh, they did a controlled study and um, did find a link between exposure to deer in terms of sort of, you know, realistic levels of neonics in the water and these birth defects. And that's a concern because deer are large mammals, we are large mammals too. And we know from CDC research that about half the US population is are regularly exposed to neonics. Uh, and they know that um, through a biomonitoring study and, and actually finding the pesticides in people's urine or the, the breakdown products of, of those pesticides in people's urine. So again, this is just a testament to how ubiquitous these pesticides are in our everyday environment and in the natural world. And those exposure levels are concerning because studies suggest that neonics may increase the risk of developmental and neurological damage in people. And um, you know, even though a lot of that science is sort of in its infancy now, I think you're gonna see more and more on that uh, in the coming years. So um, this is just to give you a sense in New York specifically, um, what evidence we have of sort of the, the ambient contamination with neonics. Um, a collection of state and federal water testing uh, finds that neonics are frequently in New York surface waters and about a, a third of Long Island groundwater. Um, you know, in talking with some of the researchers there, they mentioned that imidacloprid, which is the one neonic that they, they test for most regularly, um, was the most detected pesticide in the Long Island aquifer. So um, again, just a testament to their popularity and their ubiquity. So, um, you know, these numbers are probably underestimates because most of the water testing is just looking for imidacloprid, which is sort of the oldest and was at one point the most popular neonic. Um, but there are many more types now. Uh, you know, the tests haven't quite caught up with it, but there's a good chance that um, in a lot of these places you'd see, you know, two or three neonics uh, in the water supplies. And they're at levels, importantly, that EPA has identified as being harmful to aquatic ecosystems. So the, it's called the chronic benchmark uh, for aquatic invertebrates. Uh, which is a little wonky, but basically it's the level at which you'd expect on a long-term basis would be harmful to those aquatic in invertebrates. Again, the water bugs that fish and birds and other animals eat. Um, in New York, you know, this is also a concern for drinking water because while a lot of modern filtration techniques, carbon filtration can remove neonics from water supplies, um, a lot of groundwater use, um, you know, and certainly older treatment is, is not treated with those modern techniques and classic chlorination treatment doesn't remove neonics. Additionally, you know, New York City is famous for having an unfiltered water supply. Um, so I think there's an open question there as to, you know, how much of this contamination is getting to people's taps. Um, it's also worth noting that people are exposed um, through the consumption of food because, um, you know, when you treat an apple with neonics, because of those properties, again, that lets them get into the plant, um, those neonics are completely infused in the apple, right? You can't wash them off because they're literally inside the apple. Um, and we know from, from other testing that neonics frequently appear in produce and even in items like baby food. So, um, you know, there's been a lot written about neonics comparing it to a second silent spring. At first, when I started working on this issue about five years ago, I thought that was maybe a little bit overblown. Um, but the more and more science we get, the more and more um, that link seems to be um, true. And although, you know, DDT was a really nasty pesticide, uh, and maybe the, the effects that we're seeing are not quite as pronounced as that, um, there is the sense that these pesticides are having ecosystem-wide impacts with the pollinators being sort of the leading indicator. And the one thing that, um, I think a lot of this happens sort of before our eyes, but we're not really seeing it. It's sort of the, the environment being hollowed out from the bottom up. 
Um, but we don't notice when you know bugs and flying insects disappear. But a number of entomologists have pointed me to what they call the windscreen test or the windshield test. And if you remember driving around in say the early 90s, um, you know, through a rural area during the summertime, you'd have to use your windshield wipers to clear off all the bugs off your windshield. Um, these days, you could probably drive through that same area and um, I don't know, maybe catch one or two bugs on your windshield. So um, that's really what brought it alive to me is that a lot of this is happening before our eyes, but we're just not seeing it. But we are seeing those, bees, those bee losses. So what are, what are other countries doing um, about neonics? Um, well, across the world, the EU has banned um, all outdoor uses of the most popular neonic chemicals. Um, the, they banned sort of the three major ones. France went a little further and banned all five major neonic chemicals. Um, and um, Canada, I should note, is also moving to do the same thing. Uh, they've proposed banning neonics. Europe did it because of harms to pollinators. Canada did it because of harms to aquatic ecosystems or risks to aquatic ecosystems. They haven't finalized that decision yet. Um, we're expecting something in the spring. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if the agency follows through with that. It's been quite a while since they've proposed. Um, but here in the United States, we've done next to nothing, certainly at the federal level. Um, EPA recently sort of re-reviewed its approvals of neonics and blessed the continued widespread use of the pesticides, even with all of the harms that we know um, they cause. And um, you know, it went so far that EPA even ignored federal laws designed to protect human health and safety. Uh, they didn't apply, we don't have to get into all the legal wonky weeds, but they didn't apply certain safety factors required by federal law designed to protect people, which especially put pregnant women and children at risk. Um, and we filed a petition on that and, and they actually do some litigation around it. At the state level is probably where you've seen the most activity. Connecticut, Maryland, and Vermont all designated outdoor neonic uses as restricted use pesticides. So what that means is only a certified applicator can apply it, somebody who's licensed by the state. But as it turns out, um, you know, most applications on the farm or all applications are the farm are by certified applicators. Um, and uh, just about every landscaper has a certified applicator on staff too. So while, you know, this restricted use designation may take the pesticides off the shelves at Home Depot, um, or your local hardware store, um, it didn't really do much for the bulk of, of neonic use out there. Uh, the last thing I should mention about, you know, regulation of neonics is that a lot of this use is, again, on those treated seeds. And US EPA and in its in infinite wisdom, even though that these seeds sort of meet the definition of pesticide under federal law, they have decided not to regulate these seeds as pesticides. And that's um, led to all sorts of um, wacky things that happen when you have a massive regulatory loophole for one of the largest uses of a pesticide in the US. And um, this is just an example of that. It's not super relevant to New York, but it's interesting um, and also horrific. Uh, a ethanol facility in Mead, Nebraska accepted neonic treated seed from all across the country to turn into ethanol. And the waste products from that facility were these mounds of toxic waste that were thoroughly contaminated with neonics, uh, in addition to neonic contaminated waste lagoons. And a number of those lagoons um, spilled and there were some pipe bursts at the facility. So the contamination in that area is just off the charts. Um, sort of the thing where, you know, when it rains, uh, people talk about, you know, seeing dead animals uh, in the vicinity and certainly the, this um, whole situation, again, bees were sort of the canary in the coal mine. The person who sort of blew the whistle on this uh, facility was a bee researcher at um, the University of Nebraska who noticed that her bee populations were, were, were I mean, I, they were dropping like flies. Um, anyway, so um, here's the important part. What, what's happening in New York and what can, what can we do about it in New York State? 
So um, there's been a lot of movement in the legislature on neonics. Last session, uh, before the pandemic hit, there was a bill called the Birds and Bees Protection Act. It was a five-year moratorium on all outdoor neonic uses. But importantly, it didn't include these treated seeds that again are, are subject to this weird loophole and are not regulated as pesticides. Um, the session was sort of upended by the pandemic, um, but after, um, after all that, uh, still during the pandemic, a report from, came out from Cornell University um, that it was initially commissioned by a state agency, the Department of Agriculture and Markets, that was a huge look at um, neonic use and sort of the cost and benefit of that use. Um, on the cost side, looking at cost to pollinators, not looking at these other bigger water contamination issues, bird issues, et cetera, but looking at their cost to pollinators and also you know, how they stacked up against alternatives. It looked at over 1,100 peer reviewed papers, basically everything that has been published on neonics and bees to date. And what it found um, supports um, some, uh, maybe a tweak to the law of the initial bill that, that we saw last session. Really sort of, um, you know, the bill last session was sort of a wait and see. It was a five-year moratorium that called for more study, but we have the science in now. And um, there are a couple of things that really stand out. The first is that neonic treated corn, soybean, and wheat seeds, which account for about three quarters of the neonic use in New York agriculture, um, pose substantial risk to bees, according to the report, but they provide no overall net income benefits to farmers. So to break that down a little bit, um, they very rarely benefit farmers in terms of higher yields. And even when they do, if you consider the extra cost of having that pesticide on the seed, it's a wash. Um, the second is that these outdoor non-farm uses, these non-agricultural uses um, are either not needed or they're replaceable with safer and effective alternatives. So, um, you know, taking this information from the Cornell report, this session, we're trying to work with sponsors of the original bill and other legislators to reintroduce a bill that targets these uses of neonics for permanent prohibitions, um, because these uses are sort of the high cost, low benefit uses, the ones that either aren't providing any benefits, so we should just get rid of them entirely, or the ones that are replaceable, again, with safer alternatives. Uh, and we think that by targeting just these two areas of neonic use, you get about 80 to 90% of the neonics going into New York's environment. So you get it really at the heart of the issue with sort of minimal uh, impact on the folks that are using it, or maybe even saving them money, um, and you're helping bees and the and ecosystems. So, um, more importantly, um, you know what can you do to support these efforts um, this session? So, the legislative session, for those who don't know, started in January. It runs to mid June. Um, we don't have a bill introduction yet. I wish I could share a bill number with you, but we're hoping to get one introduced soon. We're hoping to pass it. Um, I'd love to pass it by Earth Day, but hopefully we'll pass it before the end of the session at the very least. Um, in the, in the uh, meantime, the more pressure that we can build, the more support we can build for the bill, the better. And um, you know, there are a number of ways that you can do this um, initially in, uh, I know this is a link that nobody can click on, but that's a link to our take action page. Um, you can sign up for alerts about the bill. You can notify your legislators by email. Uh, and that's sort of the, you know, sort of the lowest um, bar to entry. Uh, it's really easy. All you do is click on a web page. I'm sure you guys have all had emails where you've taken action in similar ways. Um, a more... Um, effective way of participating, although it takes a little bit more time, is following up with a call or a letter to your elected representatives, your state representatives, your state assemblyman or your state senator. Um, a lot of people overlook this, but it actually is very effective. Legislators really pay attention to 
what types of phone calls they get from constituents coming into their office. And I won't say that a single phone call will make a huge difference, but if a legislator gets even a handful of phone calls on the same issue, that's enough to um, raise their attention. If they get a couple dozen phone calls, um, then their eyes start to really perk up and, and they really do um, give the issue more attention. Um, I should also note that, you know, as the session unfolds, we're going to have other opportunities. So again, signing up for alerts uh, is a good way to be clued into that. Um, lobby days uh, and other events. Um, you know, you can even organize in your own communities, encouraging other local leaders, uh, educating them about this issue, urging them to get involved. Um, and then last but certainly not least, and this is really consistent with the, the, um, the message and the mission of the pollinator pathway, you can help bees in your own backyard. Um, I didn't talk a lot about habitat, but really it's pesticides and habitat loss that are sort of the two biggies when it comes to pollinator losses. I think the pollinator pathway is right on the money uh, in addressing the habitat issue. So that is hugely important. Um, you know, expanses of interconnected habitat are critical, uh, certainly for bees, but also for monarch butterflies and other uh, species, in particular for monarch butterflies. Uh, and of course, when you're planting pollinator-friendly, locally ap appropriate native habitat, do not use pesticides and certainly not neonics um, in any case. So um, that's it for my presentation. I think we can turn to questions. Hi there. Um, my name is Ada and I'll be your Q&A moderator for tonight. Um, the first question that we have uh, is going to come from David Gross. David says, it's my understanding that this pest, the hemlock woolly Adel guide, correct me if I say that wrong, uh, is best treated by the application of pesticides that are taken up by the tree, either by injection into the tree trunk, drenching the soil around the tree, or spraying onto the base of the tree. I understand that neonics are the best pesticides for the job and that if properly applied, they are not widespread in the forest and not available to harm pollinators. Can you please discuss this? Yeah, totally. So, and this was a major finding of the Cornell report as well. I didn't get into sort of the, the nitty gritty of the, um, of the report or, or sort of our legislative recommendations, but one of the carve outs to the non-agricultural ban that we support is an exception for the treatment for invasive species. Um, and look, you know, neonics are really good at killing bugs. <laughs> they just are. Uh, and those same properties, again, that make them so pernicious in the environment, make them really good at killing uh, hemlock woolly adelgid and other invasive species like um, emerald ash borer and spotted lanternfly. So um, right now, neonics, uh, the Cornell report concludes, neonics are sort of the best available alternative for addressing those invasive species. We think that use is fairly limited uh, and would have limited impact on, on pollinators. Um, so again, we, we support that exception because um, you, know, you sort of have to weigh costs and benefits and hemlock woolly adelgid is very pernicious and threatens sort of hemlock trees across New York state. But I won't get here and, and say that, you know, treatment for these invasive species has no impact on pollinators. Um, you know, all the same concerns are there, right? If you're treating these trees and if those trees are blooming, um, those are gonna be attractive to pollinators. Those are gonna be exposure routes to pollinators. So they are of concern, but again, compared to these other bigger uses, seed treatments, lawn care, um, et cetera, they're a really small piece of the puzzle. And given the, the trade-offs there, again, it's, a, it's an exception that we support. Our next question is, are garden flower seeds treated with neonics? Are the packets marked whether the seeds are or are not? 
or as with plants, should one assume that they are treated with neonics if not labeled? Is the labeling honest? How long do perennial plants carry the neonics? So um, there are, so there's sort of two questions there. One, are the seeds treated? And I would assume for most seeds, although I'm not an expert in terms of you know, garden seeds, I would assume most are not treated. And if they were, it would be something that is visible. So by law, when, I mean, you saw with a picture earlier, when you have a pesticide treated seed, you're gonna know it, right? Because they're colored all sorts of um, artificial dyes and that's by law to alert people to the fact that the seed is treated with a pesticide. Um, for garden plants, it's a little different though. A lot of nurseries do treat plants with neonics, again, because they're pretty good at killing bugs. And when people buy plants from garden stores, they want those plants to look perfect. Um, so um, the use of neonics, as I understand it, is pretty common in nurseries. They do persist in the plant. Uh, and certainly if you have like a plant with potting soil, perhaps in the soil as well, for a decent amount of time, it's going to vary based upon the plant. Some are going to hold that pesticide longer than others, particularly woody plants tend to hold neonics for a long time. I know in trees, neonics can last for years. Um, I'm not familiar with specificity in terms of you know, which garden plants might hold them the longest. Uh, this was a big concern for us and other groups. And there was a big campaign several years ago to get garden retailers to stop selling plants that were pre-treated with neonics. Some of the retailers made commitments. I'm not sure how many of them have followed through. Um, I believe it is a little bit better than it used to be, but it's still, uh, yeah, it's still a concern. And oftentimes that's not something that you would know. It's not labeled. Are water saving crystals for flowering plants safe for bees? Oh boy, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't assume that they're uh, problematic, but I don't wanna, I don't want to speak beyond the limits of my knowledge. For sure. Which representatives are best to call? Yours. So, um, you know, obviously there's, um, you know, in both houses, there's folks in positions of leadership. There's, you know, the heads of, of various committees where these bills would need to go through, uh, you know, and then there's, there's the leaders of the chambers themselves. But um, typically, contacting the representative who represents you in your district, your assembly person, your senator, those are the folks that are going to listen to you the most because they know that you may vote or not vote for them. Um, and by calling their office on this issue um, or any issue really, they know that it means that much that um, it may be an issue that, that would sway your vote in the next election. Um, yeah. Glyphosate has just been banned on state lands in New York. Can we use the same strategy to apply to neonics too? So right, the, the state land ban, look, any, any place where you're getting rid of these pesticides is a net gain, um, particularly because a lot of habitats for pollinators are, you know, they don't have to be that big, right? Um, you know, as opposed to like some of the larger mammals that need just massive expanses of space, pollinators can persist on relatively, um, you know, small parcels of land. So certainly getting um, glyphosate off of state lands, getting neonics out of state lands is a good start. But um, we know that most of the use of these pesticides is coming from these neonic treated corn and soybean seeds. Um, as well as lawn care uses and garden uses on private lands. So um, while I, I certainly think it's a good step, it's, it's not um, a public lands ban doesn't really get at the heart of the issue. And that's, that's what we're trying to do this session. We're trying to get at the heart of the issue and do it in a relatively painless way. Again, the uses that people really aren't gonna miss, they could probably actually save some money by not um, using the pesticides. What groups are opposing this legislation? That's a very good question. Um, certainly the Chemistry Council, so the folks that um, manufacture the pesticides, 
So, I mean, you know, when you think about neonic use on corn and soybean seeds, it's hard to think of somebody who wins, right? These are poisoning the environment. Um, they're costing farmers money. Um, and so, you know, for most folks, you know, nobody's winning in that equation, but the chemical companies are winning because they charge money to put that pesticide on the seed. And um, oftentimes these days, the people who are making the seed are also the people who are making the pesticide. So they have an interest in having it sold as one package that then they can charge more money for the value add. And actually a lot of conventional corn, farmers can't even find conventional corn without a neonic pretreatment. Um, so, um, so certainly the chemical companies, um, you know, historically we've had pushback from the Farm Bureau as well, conventional farmers. Um, and again, that's, that's a little curious to me um, because, um, you know, a lot of these uses are not beneficial to farmers, although perhaps some of that historically has come from, you know, the way that the bill was phrased or, or framed in the past you know, the old version of the bill was an across the board moratorium. And as the Cornell report finds, some of the agricultural uses on fruit and vegetables uh, can be beneficial. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, we'll see what happens when a new narrower bill is introduced, whether we'll get the same sort of pushback or whether folks will uh, in the farming community will understand that, you know, maybe getting rid of these pesticides and giving farmers more choice to buy a non-treated seed uh, will actually open up the market and benefit them by lowering input costs. Um, and I, historically, we've also had some pushback from landscapers um, because they're one of the major users of the pesticide. And the argument is, you know, regardless of what the pesticide is, they want to have as many, they use the expression tools in the toolbox. And whenever you take a tool away from the toolbox, that's a bad thing, uh, no matter how bad the pesticide is or how pernicious. I had my ash trees treated for borers. The forester assured me that it wouldn't hurt anything but the borers. Is that true? Um, <laughs> I don't want to call your forester out. Um, you know, any insecticide that um, they're going to be injecting into that ash tree, and, and my guess is it's probably a neonic, because uh, that's one of the more common treatments for ash borer. Um, it's, it's just going to kill in insect life indiscriminately. Um, we don't have a lot of pesticides at this point that are targeting, you know, just one species. Um, there are some, some new technological types of pesticides where people are talking about targeting the specific DNA of a particular pest. Uh, I know there's some um, worry that maybe the, the targeting won't be that exact. But right now, in the main, m most of these insecticides that they'd be using would be broad spectrum insecticides. And what that means is it kills a broad spectrum of insects. So um, certainly it would affect the ash borer, but my guess is it would also affect other insect life as well. It seems that there will always be another DDT neonic, et cetera. How do we instill a sense of stewardship for our living systems instead of these chemical bludgeons that are currently used? That is right on the money. Um, and it's funny, you know, I, I draw from my experience in the fracking fight and in a way the answer there um, was clearer. So we, we fought fracking in New York, but the answer to fracking was renewable energy, right? Um, and it was something we had to do because climate change is an ex existential crisis. And I think the same is true in agriculture, but may maybe we're a little bit earlier in time. The, the way that we're growing our food is something that is not long-term sustainable, right? If you look at how pesticides are used, if you look at the amount of pesticides used, um, you know, the conventional produce that I was growing, that I ate growing up in the 80s, had way less <laughs> glyphosate uh, and other pesticides than, than you see being used today with the advent of, you know, GMO crops and, and the combination of pesticides with that and also the use of neonics and, and some of these newer chemistries. 
And as soon as a bug becomes resistant to one class of one chemistry, oftentimes the producers will just put two pesticides on the crop instead of one. Um, or in the case of where there's a regulatory prohibition, you know, you're totally right, another pesticide comes along. I think there is a sense that we made some progress. Again, I don't want to go back to the days of DDT. We need to get rid of chlorpyrifos and, and other organophosphates um, that are harmful to people in the environment. So we are, there is some progress being made, but, you know, neonics grew out of that and all of the problems associated with that. And I think the answer here, you know, sort of the parallel to renewable energy is regenerative agriculture and also using the power of the natural world to control pests. So one sort of, one sort of pernicious thing that neonics do is that in killing the pests, they also kill all of the pest predators, right? So they kill the bugs that eat the bad bugs. And so in a way, um, to the extent that they are effective on any uses, they're sort of self-fulfilling, uh, it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's, it's sort of a vicious cycle, right? They create their own need. Um, so, you know, the question is how to, how to break that. And I think there are a lot of folks working in the regenerative agriculture space, uh, finding ways to grow crops in, in ways that don't use pesticides all or that use less pesticides fewer pesticides or um, less pernicious pesticides. Certainly the, the organic industry is a model of that. They found a way to grow produce um, effectively and um, uh, uh, cost efficiently with, um, without the use of these synthetic pesticides. But I think it's, it's something that um, a lot of people are interested in studying. I think that is ultimately the future. Um, but even what we know now, right? I mean, if you look at the science, three quarters of the neonic use in agriculture just doesn't benefit farmers, right? It, it isn't needed. We could get rid of it and we could replace it with nothing today and nobody would miss it. Um, you know, and why that doesn't happen, that's, um, I don't know, that's, that, that's that you're wrong. There, there's a lot of complications there. Sorry, but I'm talking on. What would you recommend we do when asking suppliers whether they use neonics on native plants? Should we look for plants with holes? Should we cut off the first year's flowers? How persistent do neonics stay in the soil or within the plant? Ooh, that, again, that's a tough one. And I'm wondering if there might be resources online for that. Um, it's so variable and, and that sort of you know, the complexity of this issue. There are a number of different neonic chemicals. There are a number of different types of plants. The treatments that particular nurseries might be using are different. All of these things affect the persistence time. Um, neonics do degrade when they're sort of exposed to sunlight, but sort of the nature of the pesticide is often they're like either injected into a plant or they're put into the soil and that's where they can persist for a long period of time. So um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. I know they can persist for years in the soil, but my guess is um, if it's a home garden plant after the first year, probably um, you'd be okay, but it, it would really depend. Is it better to treat ash trees in the fall because there's less insect and bird activity? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know much about the specifics of ash treatment, um, but sort of the rule of thumb is um, they, the, initially with neonics, people thought that time, place, and manner restrictions, like applying them after bloom or when bees weren't present would be helpful. And I think they are to some extent, but in the main, they fall short because the whole manner in which neonics are designed to be used is they're meant to persist. They're meant to get into the plant. Um, you know, they're, they're meant to sort of continue to provide, you know, to put a positive spin on it, that protection for the plant. Um, in trees, the persistence is about as long as it is anywhere. So, 
you would be worried, even if you treat it in the fall, about the effects of that pesticide next season in the spring, because those neonics would, would likely still be in the tree. Um, they might be at lower concentrations, so maybe treatment in the fall does make sense. But again, um, to some degree, there's only so much there's only so much you can do. Are the NRDC and its allies engaged in and or supporting neonic divestment campaigns? Oh, that's interesting. Um, no, uh, we haven't thought of that. Um, it would be really a divestment. I mean, at this point, that would be trickier because neonics are off of patent. So it's not just the big agrochemical companies that are making these pesticides anymore. Uh, it's sort of like when a drug comes off a patent, you get all of these folks making generic drugs. That's sort of what's happening with neonics now. So divesting from the big players wouldn't necessarily um, prevent all of that from happening. Um, and it's also worth noting that the big players here, uh, Bayer, Syngenta, uh, what used to be Dow DuPont, but is now Corteva AgriScience. There's like four big players uh, that make these pesticides. Um, so it wouldn't be just divesting on this particular issue. It would be, you know, everything else in their portfolio. And Bayer, of course, makes aspirin and all sorts of other products too. So, um, which I, I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> you know, that might be the right idea too. But no, it's something that we haven't, haven't pursued. How do we flip the conversation so that the manufacturers must prove safety before they are unleashed into the environment rather than after to do their damage? I love this question. Um, that, again, this is, this is totally on the money. Um, the way that our pesticide laws work, um, the pesticide manufacturers go to EPA and they ask to get the pesticide approved. And in order to do that, um, they have to provide all of these studies. Uh, and depending on the type of pesticide, EPA has lists. They're called data requirements, right? So they have to present all of this data to EPA to prove um, that their pesticide uh, will not have unreasonable adverse impacts on the environment. That's the standard, right? Because people know that pesticides are harmful. But um, you know, EPA in its, its infinite wisdom has to decide that those impacts are not unreasonable. Um, the problem with the system is that all of the science and all of the data is provided by the pesticide companies, right? It's not, and they say that they use independent labs, but these are independent labs that are being paid by Bayer and Monsanto and, and Corteva. I mean, they know who's buttering their bread. So, um, the system, the system is broken. Um, and there should be an independent verification. There should be an onus to show that the pesticide is truly safe before um, it is out on the market. Um, and there's been a lot of efforts in uh, Congress, uh, US Congress, to address that with FIFRA reform over the years. Um, but those have fallen short. And um, I think it would be something that's politically very difficult to do now. It's something that, that we've worked on as well, but um, you know, there's, there's just not a huge appetite politically for pesticide reform right now. Great, um, our last question, um, maybe we can get you a little help to answer this is, how do you join Pollinator Pathways? George, I'll, I'll defer to you on this one. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Okay, there I am, all right. Um, yeah, so uh, what you need to do is you go to our website, which is uh, uh, woodstocknypollinatorpathway.org and you go to the uh, join button and all you have to do is you have to, uh, agree to do certain things like reduce the lawn, 
leave the leaves, uh, plant or nurture uh, native, productive native plants, plants that will be uh, helpful to pollinators. And uh, leave the leaves, meaning don't break up all your leaves in the fall, because those are where the insect larvae live during the winter. Uh, if you agree to do these things, then you can join the, uh, join the pathway. It doesn't cost any money. And it's just a way of registering your property so that uh, you become you know, part of the larger uh, area of, of pollinator habitat. So your, your property becomes part of that. Um, anyway, hope that's clear. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Georgia. And Dan, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. Um, it appears we've gotten to all of our questions tonight. So um, Georgia, I will turn it over to you. Okay, good. Well, yeah, and let me thank you, Dan, for this very, very informative presentation. And um, I also want to thank our Pollinator Pathway team who helped uh, really make this evening happen. Adam, Alex, Etta, and Caroline. Uh, and thanks, of course, to all of you who attended and all of those people who asked these really good questions. Uh, I hope you all got as much out of it as I did. Uh, now, we'll be following up with an email to everyone who is here uh, with some links to articles and more information that Dan has uh, so that you can read further on this topic. Um, okay, and I wanna let you know also that this event is being recorded now and live streamed on Facebook where it'll be immediately available if you want to view it again or if you want to send it to someone. Also in a few days, there'll be a link on our website, the website I mentioned, woodstocknypollinatorpathway.org. Uh, same thing, you can, view it again if you want to. Uh, by the way, there are other uh, videos on that website from uh, some of our past presentations that you might really, really like. Okay. Um, okay. Um, you can also on our, uh, on our Pollinator Pathway website, you can get a lot of information on how to create uh, habitat for pollinators. Um, Okay, as far as future events uh, of the pollinator pathway, on March 31st, we're doing a, a presentation on um, invasive plant species uh, that get into your garden and what you can do about them. They're, they're not good because they crowd out the natives. Um, and then another presentation we'll be having is this isn't pollinator pathway, but this is the Woodstock film and discussion series. Uh, we're gonna have a really great presentation on the Hudson Valley Farm Hub on March 25th. And this is really related to what we're talking about here because it, we'll be focusing on the research that the Farm Hub is doing on nurturing and encouraging beneficial insects to control the crop pests uh, by planting certain um, pollinator friendly plants or, you know, insect friendly plants. Um, in other words, they're working on using insects as pest control rather than pesticides. So it's really a good idea. Okay, again, I want to thank you for coming this evening and I hope you enjoyed it.